on page four. Uh, what we're going to do is have you guys read it uh, line by line. That's how I want to take it uh, so that you understand it. Because what you might hear uh, from your buyers is, can you explain this to me? And if you don't know how to explain it, they're going to lose all confidence. And that's what you don't want. Uh, any agent who don't, doesn't know how to uh, explain the contract uh, should not, because really that's our job, right? And the contract uh, really protects our client. That's what we want. So by knowing everything in that contract, uh, you can help your client uh, one by protecting them, and two, actually knowing what will be the best thing to put into the contract to one make it stronger and to protect them. Okay. So we'll start off with Carrie. We're going to go with G1. If you want to read it for us. Got to read loud so the camera can be careful. Thank you. Okay, good. Uh, as a buyer's agent, what you want to do is make sure you get that preliminary title report uh, as soon as possible. Uh, because that pretty much shows you who owns title and if title can be transferred over free and clear. Okay, so hopefully uh, when you guys open up transactions like you just did uh, this, this week, uh, you want to make sure that you get that preliminary title report uh, within that specific time frame that you asked for it. Now, because uh, there are some new agents here, they may not know exactly what that premium is. Uh, talk to us for support, and we can tell you how to go over it uh, so that you can explain it to your clients. Because what usually happens is when you get that preliminary title report from escrow, your buyers also get it. And if they get it, uh, they're going to flip through it and they're going to, what the heck does this mean? Uh, it's our job to make them understand uh, what it is. So it's usually between 10 to 20 pages, depending on if it's a single family or condo. Uh, but you guys should actually review one uh, to make sure you know what it's about. Okay? So hopefully, uh, when you guys open escrow, you get that preliminary target. Oh, it's usually within the first week. It's in the first seven to ten days at least. Uh, but you want to make sure that title is able to transfer uh, and that you want to move forward. Because what you don't want to do as a buyer's agent is spend money or spend your buyer's money and find out title can't be transferred. That would really suck. Okay? G2, Adam. Yes. I had a question about that. Okay, so I just, you know, whenever you get those things, you, Thanks, you shouldn't what things? the preliminary okay. title report. Yes. We shouldn't just assume that the, that the title company has looked at it. We should actually read it all ourselves. I mean, it's like so long. Of course. That's why, we, that, yes, yeah. that's why they get the copy. But uh, that's why everybody gets Yeah, yeah. And again, there are times where you read the preliminary title report and you don't understand it. Uh, you can ask your school for an explanation. Uh, what you really want to do is have your client understand it fully. Okay? So, I mean, if there's something strange about it, would, mm -hmm. wouldn't the title company like bring that to our attention if it's something... Maybe not. Not necessarily. Yeah, that's, why, that's why you want to go through it to see if there's any red flag. So we can't, just, we can't count on them doing that? Well, I'm going to count on anybody. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Th that's why the buyers hire us. That's why we get paid good money because we're looking out for our clients. And one of the things uh, we do, at least for the preliminary title is at least review it and see if there's anything that's incorrect. Because what you might see is like liens on the property. Like say there's a tax lien on the seller for $100,000. They're selling a property for 500 and their mortgage is 450. If the seller doesn't have enough money to pay off that lien, <coughs> I don't can't transfer. So you kind of want to know that. Right. Take that. G2 title. Seller agrees to convey the property with warranty investing, marketable title and buyer, free and clear of all liens and encumbrances except easements, covenants, conditions, reservations, and restrictions now on record. Including but not limited to those documents relating to a condominium, cooperative, PUD, subdivision, homeowners, community association, or cluster development, and length. Good. 
So what this particular uh, paragraph means is that some homes uh, may have deed restrictions. Uh, and that deed restrictions is something you should know because let's just say you're buying a house on a mountain uh, and there's uh, height restrictions on that particular home. You wanna let your, your buyers know because say if they wanna build and they wanna build up and it's not possible to do that, you wanna let them know that uh, so you can cancel. Because if that's something they have their heart set on doing, telling them that sorry you can't do it you closed on it you own the house uh, so again that's why the preliminary credit point is important because it tells you what you can and cannot do in the deed restrictions uh, same with condo docs the condominium docs tell you basically what you can and cannot do in that particular uh, building or project uh, keep in mind uh, with condo docs yes it has the rules and regulations but one of the most important documents uh, to review is the RR 105 and the income statements because that will kind of tell you uh, the condition of that particular association. Okay, questions? Deed restrictions, that's what you know. Uh, good, Dr. G2A. Buyer's review of preliminary title. Report. If buyer is not satisfied with preliminary title report, buyer may elect within seven or blank days of buyer's receipt of the preliminary title report to terminate the purchase contract pursuant to paragraph 02. Good. Uh, so what I want to do is basically talk about this paragraph one. Uh, if you're writing an offer, how to make that offer stronger, and, and two, uh, just to give you an idea of what that really is. So. What it's saying is this, once you receive the preliminary entire report, you have X amount of days to review it. If you're not happy with what the prelim says, uh, you can cancel the you know, paragraph 02. Typically, we put seven days. Uh, if you want to make that offer stronger, you may want to put three to five. So again, all you're doing is you're shortening the time frames to make your offer look a lot better. How long does it take to go over a prelim? Uh, 10 minutes, 10, 15 minutes. Uh, it's just a matter of uh, talking to your buyers. Uh, they still want to proceed with the contract or cancel. So you may need a few days to do that. Seven days, I think, is a lot of time. Uh, but I think if you're on it, uh, three to five should be enough. OK, good. Any questions on that? OK, let's move on. G2B, title defects. Who's next? Henry. Uh, title defects. Uh if the buyer elects not to terminate under paragraph G2, uh, A, and if the preliminary title report or any other report or any updates to such reports reveal that the title cannot be delivered by seller in accordance with paragraph G2, then the seller shall make appropriate disclosures under paragraph 1 to 2, and the seller shall use re reasonable efforts to cure any title defects. If within seven days following receipt of any reported title defect, seller does not cure such title defects, buyer may elect to purchase the property with such title defects and or seller shall not be liable for such title defects. If buyer elects not to accept the property with such title defects, either buyer or seller may elect to terminate this purchase contract pursuant to paragraph 03. Oh my God. Crazy, yeah? So what we'll do is this. We'll break it down line by line so that you guys understand what this particular paragraph means. So, first sentence. If buyer elects not to terminate under paragraph G2, the preliminary title report, or any other reports, or any updates to such reports review that the title cannot be delivered by seller in accordance with paragraph G2, then the seller shall make appropriate disclosures under paragraph I2, which is... Uh, seller's disclosures, and the seller should use reasonable efforts to cure any title defects, okay? So what it's basically saying is, if you get the prelim, title cannot be transferred free and clear, uh, the seller is gonna disclose why it can't be that way. However, it's also saying if within, it's usually seven days, uh, following the receipt of any, of any reported title defects, seller does not cure such title defects, buyer may elect to purchase the property, with such title defects and seller should not be liable for such defects. So basically what happens here is the seller says, there's defects on my title and I'm letting you know. 
So now the buyer has the opportunity to still buy that property with that title defect. Uh, bear in mind, uh, you have to understand that title insurance may be uh, affected. Uh, so you always want to talk to somebody who understands uh, what's wrong with title. Okay. So if buyer elects not to accept the property with such title defects, either buyer or seller may elect to terminate this purchase contract pursuant to paragraph 02. So again, seller has title defects, discloses to buyer that there's defects. Uh, the buyer cannot cancel if they choose not to buy it with that particular defect. Questions? Pretty straightforward. Yes? You said talk to somebody who knows about the title. Yes, is that like the title? Is that like the title company person or is that a lawyer? Uh, depending on that particular defect, right? So if it's understandable, uh, then you probably wouldn't need uh, anybody to explain. Uh, escrow is a great source uh, for understanding uh, title defects because they can kind of tell you what it's about. Uh, but the reason I say that is because if you represent buyer, and let's just say the buyer is head over here, heels over this property, and they really want it, they don't care, they'll just do whatever it takes. Sometimes that's not, that's not the best uh, thing to do because that title may affect them later on down the line. So you always want to check what that defect is to make sure uh, that it's not going to affect your buyer. So that's who you get. Okay. Are there some title defects that, I mean, to me it seems like any title defect would be not, you wouldn't want, I mean, if I were to buy something. Uh, so I don't know. Things but that just don't matter? I mean, there's some categories. So they have a tax lien of $5,000. I'll buy it. They can't pay it. I'll buy it. I'll pay it. Could be that. Could be anything. You're right. It could be absolutely anything. But as a buyer, uh, it depends, right? Because there's some buyers who say, I don't care what's wrong with it. I'll just deal with it. That's fine. But at least you disclose to them that there is a defect, and this is what it is, and this is what can happen. Right? And if they still want to buy it, buy it. As long as you disclose to them that that can happen, or something can happen. Okay? Questions? Questions? Okay, I'm falling asleep. Mm. <laughs> ah, good. Hello. Page five. G3, who's next? Richard. Vesting and tenancy. Okay. Title shall vest in buyers as follows. Provide legal, full legal name and marital status for individuals. Trust information, name and form of business, entity, etc. Then title. Tenancy shall be to be determined as well. If buyer has not yet determined the vesting and or tenancy, buyer shall provide escrow in writing with the selected names and tenancy within seven days, 15 days if left blank, after acceptance date. Good, so I'm a single person. I asked my agent, how do I take title? And my agent goes, oh, you're single. Tenants in several. Is that okay? No, Tyrus, you should not be advising how to take tenants. Yes, very good. You should not be advising our buyers how to take tenants. You can explain to them what all the tenants, what are the, what are the four tenancies, anybody? Tenants, everything, common, joint, entirety. One more. Several. Joint tenancy. Tenants, everybody, tenants in common, tenants by the entirety. Joint tenants. Good. Uh, we can explain to them uh, what it is, but we cannot choose for them. Why? They choose. They choose. Well, we're not attorneys, right? <coughs> we're not supposed to. Uh, we don't have to. Yeah, we're not the legal expert. Right? So, uh, if they need somebody to refer to, uh, escrow is a good place because they can explain it. Uh, it's just a matter of you not telling them what to pick. Mm -hmm. Okay? And remember, Remember, if you're representing buyers, make sure they actually inform escrow how they want to take title. Because if they don't, and they're married, how will escrow write up the docs? Yeah. Okay. 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 Very good. Ooh, what class did you take? <laughs> 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 yes, tenants in common. Uh, and that sucks, because if you wanted to do it tenants by the entirety, I've already closed, you're gonna have to redraw docs, and that costs money. 
So get it right the first time. Always make sure uh, that your buyer is set in that uh, escrow instruction on how they want to do the title. Uh, take it a step further and also call escrow and make sure that they have uh, turned it in. Because I had an instance where I worked with a husband and wife, asked them if they turned it in. They said yes. Uh, I had no reason not to believe them, uh, but they did it. And they took title tenants in common. It cost us 250 bucks to get it changed to tenants by retiree. So just know that it costs time and money to do things like that. Okay? Good. Any questions on G3? Good, let's move on. H1, Section H, Cash Funds and Financing Contingency. Who's next? Psst. No tenants, uh, contingency on obtaining cash funds. Buyer represents that there are no contingencies on buyers obtaining the necessary cash, including all deposit down payment including loan costs to buy the property, collectively cash fund. Buyers shall neither delay or extend the scheduled closing date to obtain the cash fund. Okay, stop there. We're going to talk about that paragraph first. Anytime you represent a buyer and they have a contingency to get the money, you should always check contingency on obtaining cash fund because you're protecting your buyers from losing their Okay, so let me give you examples because I've actually had clients like this. Let's just say I own a classic car and I know I can get $50,000 for it, but I didn't sell it yet. Is that a contingency for cash fund? You'd be using the sale of the car to put the down payment or to put it in escrow then next. Yes, absolutely. So put that down as a contingency because it'll protect your buyer uh, from losing their deposit in the event that things go awry uh, and all of a sudden you can't sell the car for $50,000. Okay? You should also time frame it too, like subject to buyer selling his classic car by X amount of days and receiving X amount of dollars. Uh, the more information you put, the better uh, because it protects your buyer uh, from losing the deposits. Now what you have to understand though is that when you put contingencies like that, uh, you weaken your offer, yeah. right? So again, if they can sell the car before they make the offer, that would be better. Uh, that would actually be really better because now you're, sh you're sure that your buyer is interested in actually buying a property. Uh, so again, explain to them, yeah, you can do that, but what you want to do as your agent is uh, show them how to write the most uh, strongest offer possible and by having a contingency side of the car, uh, that makes that offer pretty weak, pretty weak. That's the way I would see it, if all these stuff is okay. Okay, what if they have money in stocks and bonds? Is that a contingency? Yes. What was that? Stocks. Yeah, it's absolutely a contingency because we know at any given time uh, it can lose value, right? So you may have a hundred thousand dollars value in stock, stocks and bonds, but if he sells it on a specific date and only makes 50,000, uh, not good, right? So again, that's a contingency also. Is it a contingency uh, to get money from a home equity line of credit? If, if it still has a lot of cash in the equity line of credit, then that's good as cash. But if its limit is already rich. Wow, very good. That's kind of like a trick question. So if they have to apply to get the home equity line of credit, yes, it absolutely is a contingency. If they already have it, where they can just write a check for that amount, you're fine. Okay? Good. Any questions on contingencies for obtaining cash funds? If not, let's move on to H1A. Kai. Yep, verification of cash funds. Again? Okay. I like your voice. <laughs> okay. Which one? Uh, H1 H1A. H1A. Verification of cash funds. Buyers shall provide evidence that is satisfactory to the seller of the availability of cash funds within uh, X amount of days 
after the assessment phase. If buyer is unable or fails to provide such evidence within the specific specified time period, seller may elect, uh, elect to terminate this purchase contract pursuant to paragraph 03. Paragraph 03, good. So what this is saying is this. If I'm a buyer, I want to provide the seller proof that I have cash. So there's a couple of ways that you can prove uh, that you have that cash. One way is through bank statements, showing the amount. Of course, you always want to black out the account number. Uh, or two, which I do, uh, only because I want to protect my buyer's uh, information, is just have the lender write a letter to the selling agent saying that they have, or they saw X amount of dollars in their account, and they can vouch. Than having. Okay, some sellers agents uh, will not accept that. If that's the case, they do not show bank statements. Uh, however, I've been doing that for the past few offers that we wrote, and they're okay with that. They're okay with that. And just let them know that it's okay to call the lender and talk to them. Uh, buyers like that because um, a lot of buyers don't want that. Don't want to let people know how much money they actually have. So by having the lender say they have X amount of dollars available to purchase the property, uh, that protects uh, the accounts uh, from the buyer. So either way, depending on the buyer uh, and how they feel with their information. Okay, uh, where it says buyer shall provide evidence that is satisfactory to the seller. Typically, we like to see under five days. Anything longer than that, um, that kind of makes sellers worry about if you really truly have the money or not. Uh, if you want to make your offer strong, what you want to do is provide that particular information up front with the offer. Done that before, really helps get the offer accepted. Uh, and then we even need to worry about actually getting it. Uh, because there are times where buyers uh, say they can get your information quickly, uh, but they can. So to get it up front, uh, simple. I would just say, hey, you know what? I want to make your offer look super strong. It's probably best if you give me that information up front so I can submit it with that offer. Right? It's true. If you do, it'll be a more stronger offer. So why not do it up front so you don't need to worry about it five days later? Okay? Good. H2. Talk. Contingency on obtaining cash funds. In reference to the balance of down payment or balance of purchase price, if all cash, buyer's obligation to purchase or Alright, so if there's any contingencies for obtaining cash funds, this is where you want to put it. So, one of the most common ones is selling a home. If you're selling a home and you need cash to purchase the home that you're purchasing, uh, that's what you would put down. Typically, if you're making an offer and you're trying to sell your home, it's best if it's in escrow. Because that's the strongest you can possibly make. So what you would put down is the property address, who the escrow agent is escrowing that particular transaction. And the reason you want to do that is because you want to have that seller call that agent to confirm that it's in escrow and uh, where it's at in regards to closing. So the closer it is to closing, the stronger your offer becomes. However, because there's a contingency, it's still a weaker offer than somebody who does not have a contingency. So again, uh, when writing contracts, if you want to make it strong, uh, there are times where people leave it out. Yes, it's a contingent, but they leave it out because they know they're super close in closing the property, the buyer got final loan approval, and it is going to close. Uh, if they feel that confident, uh, then maybe you can leave it out because it'll make that offer stronger. But remember now, our job is to protect our buyers and their deposits. So if there's any doubt whatsoever that it's not going to close, even like 1%, put it in. Put it in because that's at least an out for your buyer. And you can always call, call the seller's agent and say, hey, this is where we're at uh, in the transaction. So it looks pretty strong, uh, and there's a really good chance that it will close, and we will get the money uh, to use for the down payment. So again, communication is key with the other agent, uh, because the more you talk to them, uh, the, the, the better chance you have with actually working with them, because they like uh, agents who communicate with each other. If you're an agent who just writes up an offer, faxes it to them, and that's it, eh, I probably wouldn't have to work with you. So if I had an agent who calls me and said, hey, this is my offer, 
uh, how do you want me to write that offer? I'd be wrong to work with something like that because if you're willing to make the changes prior to even writing that offer, oh my God, that's the best kind of agent you probably want to work with. You know it's going to go smooth, right? So again, follow those new agents who took our class. Remember how I told you it's best to network with all the people in your class? It really is. Because you, if you have that opportunity to work with them, uh, they're probably going to choose you over anybody else. So what you have to understand is, I don't see it as competition between other agents. I see it as uh, alliances that are formed in order to make a buyer and seller happy. That's the goal, right? Because we represent buyer or seller. Uh, and we want to make sure that they're happy with the transaction. Because a happy buyer or seller gives you what? More money. <laughs> Girls, good <laughs> God, <laughs> come on. Uh, going back to the issue. Uh, what issue? You can do 30, 30, 31 exchange. And uh, as you said, yes. Uh, what is, what do you, what do you ask? 31, 31 exchange. What is that? Uh, so when you, when, uh, when uh, somebody wants to exchange, uh, they sell their house to buy a new property. Why would you do a 31 exchange? I mean, just probably to, People What's the main purpose of them? Prolong the taxes. Defer taxes. That's what I'm doing. Defer taxes. So Good. You, you can do that thing. And, and by the way, you told us that last year there's a new law for owner occupants to yes. do the exchange too. Yes. I, I'm just talking, I, I just talked to Harry once the one from that mm -hmm. that the old couple can sell their old house right. for a profit and do the 1031 exchange because yes. there's a program there. And they can, can save 500,000 capital gain. So the remaining money that they have, they can do that exchange. They can exchange. So that would be a good thing for Absolutely. somebody. Absolutely. I just closed one where the owner may over uh, that amount. Uh, but he actually decided to not do it and just pay the taxes. Uh, so we talked to an accountant, and the accountant actually did a really good job in not making him pay anything. So his net, he was single, his net was I think 400 something, uh, but he was able to write off the difference of money. Uh, so no taxes, which was really cool. Was really cool. So again, <coughs> you want to have access to people like that, because again, we're helping, right, our buyers. Uh, and if you just say, yeah, do whatever you want, and he gets taxed on the 150, that's not cool, right? We want to try whatever we can do Oh, sorry. <laughs> Smile when you pass the camera. <laughs> Actually, if you pass the camera, you have to make a funny face for everybody, right? She yeah. did. <laughs> what was that, fear? Okay. So did that, did that answer your question? Yeah. Okay, good. What is that? Better yet? Did you ever taste the strawberry and orange? Not yet. I've seen it though. Yeah. But I didn't try it. The is it good? Yeah, it is. Strawberry Actually, oh, one? Yeah, they make strawberry and orange. Oh my god. Should can I pause can this? Can you edit that? I was just going to say, can you edit that? There's no yeah, editing yeah, this. <laughs> cut, cut this part out. Every, every time you forget to pause or, re, or forward this, you're going to hear this pss, pss. Yeah. <laughs> I noticed that. We're going to do that all the time, by the way, because I always forget. Okay, so that's H2. Any questions on that? No? So who read H2? Okay, you gotta do H2A next. H2A. Buyer shall provide evidence that is satisfactory to seller of buyer's ability to obtain balance of down payment or balance of purchase price of all cash within X number of days after the acceptance date. Okay, stop. So that date will actually be determined on what that contingency is, right? Because if it's a sale of property and you're not even close, it can't be five days. It may be 30 days, it might be 45 days. Shoot, might even be 60 days out. Uh, but again, we're writing the contract to protect your buyer. So make sure you know exactly when you're gonna be able to say, you know what, there's satisfactory proof that we have the money for down payment, okay? So, <laughs> A lot of different scenarios. It could be two days, right? Oh, I need to sell my stocks, and I can do that in two days. Actually, it takes longer than that. Um, but just make sure you give the buyer enough time, yet at the same time, 
shortening that period to make that offer strong. Because once you start filling out contingencies and obtaining cash funds, your offer now becomes weaker than anybody else who does not have that. So know that. Because when we're writing offers, I don't know about you guys, but I write offers to win. That's the goal. If you're just writing offers just to make an offer, shame on you. You're not representing your buyers. You're writing offers to win. That's the goal. And you want to make that offer as strong as possible uh, with the intent of protecting them in the event that there is some type of contingency. Okay? H2B, please. Yes, H2B, yeah. yeah. Yes. B. If buyer fails to provide seller with such satisfactory evidence within the specified time period in paragraph H2A, seller may elect to terminate this purchase contract pursuant to paragraph O2, O3. O3, good. So what it's basically saying is, if you don't show satisfactory proof within that time frame that you put down, seller can say, you know what, you can't buy the property. So know your time frames. Uh, we live in Hawaii, where it's super laid back, and a lot of agents are laid back, meaning if that time period passes, they'll still go, ah, just give it to me, right? Don't take that as the norm, because there's agents out there who stick to that time frame. Mm -hmm. And the bottom line is the reason why we write contracts that the buyer, to protect the buyer and seller. So just make sure if you put five days, you get that information within five days. Because if you don't, the seller can say, nope, we're gonna cancel. So just think, if you represent a buyer, and let's just say your contingency is for 20 days, okay? 20 days. So your inspection, J1, is for 10 days. So you pay an inspector to go look at a property, right? And you pay that inspector and all of a sudden you forget to give them satisfactory uh, conditions on obtaining cash funds, and it's the 21st day. So I can basically say, you know what, we're canceling because you missed that time frame. What just happened? The boss. The buyer just lost that money he paid for the inspection. So know that. Know that. Very important to follow time frames. Okay? Good. H2C. If seller is satisfied with evidence timely provided by buyer in paragraph H2A, the buyer is unable to ultimately deposit the balance of down payment or balance of purchase price if all cash into escrow in accordance with paragraph D2, then one, buyer may elect to terminate this purchase contract pursuant to paragraph O2, or two, if buyer elects not to terminate this purchase contract under paragraph H2C1, then seller may elect to terminate this purchase contract pursuant to paragraph O2, O3. Any questions on that? Pretty, pretty self-explanatory, right? Can't get the money back from the to cancel. Uh, if not, the seller can elect to cancel. Okay. Recording. <laughs> you can edit. I'm not editing, recording. <laughs> okay, H3. Eric. Financing contingency. Buyer's obligation to purchase the property is contingent upon buyer obtaining the loan described in paragraph D2, mortgage loan. If buyer does not obtain a conditional loan commitment letter or is unable to satisfy all conditions of the loan commitment letter, within the time period specified in paragraph H4, then buyer may elect to terminate this purchase contract pursuant to paragraph O2. Keep going? Yep. Okay. Just go to B and then we'll explain. All right. If buyer has met all conditions of the loan commitment letter but lender fails to fund prior to closing, then buyer may elect to terminate this purchase contract pursuant to paragraph O3. Actually, go to C and then we'll explain. Buyer, <coughs> buyer may, one, waive the waive this financing contingency and purchase the property on, all, on an all cash basis, or two, increase the amount of cash funds in order to satisfy all of the lender's requirements for funding the loan. If buyer elects either of these two options, buyer should promptly provide written notice of such election to seller together with evidence of buyer's ability to perform prior to expiration of the time period stated in paragraph H4. Okay, good. 
So financing contingency. Anytime a buyer gets financing, you always want to explain to them this particular paragraph. And the reason you want to do that is because they have outs. They have outs. Okay? So let's just go through it one by one. So buyer's obligation to purchase the property is contingent upon buyer obtaining the loan described in paragraph D2. So everybody knows what D2 is, right? You guys don't have that paper. Right? So D2 <coughs> just shows the breakdown of how they're going to purchase the property. So purchase price, initial additional deposit, and how they're going to do a loan. So that loan could be what? FHA, DA, conventional, USDA, whatever it is, right? That explains how the loan is done. Okay, A, the buyer does not obtain a conditional loan commitment letter or is unable to satisfy all conditions of the loan commitment letter within the time period specified in paragraph H4, then buyer may elect to terminate this purchase contract pursuant to paragraph O2. So what it's basically saying is this, lender has X amount of time to get loan or conditional loan approval. If lender cannot get that conditional loan approval, you pretty much do one of two things. One, has to sell it for an extension, or two, cancel. Okay? B, if buyer has met all conditions of the loan commitment letter, but the lender fails to front prior to closing, then buyer may elect to terminate this purchase contract. Never seen that happen, because if you get this far with the buyer, they probably want to close. Uh, however, you have that option to cancel, in the event that they cannot fund the loan. I just thought of it. Did that scenario ever happen to us? <laughs> Where we got final loan approval, but lender could not fund, so we canceled it. Never did. I've never heard of that situation, so <laughs> hopefully not, because you put all that time and effort in yeah. buying something, you want to make sure it funds. And see, buyer may waive this financing contingency and purchase the property on an all-cash basis, which means they can say, forget financing, I have the cash, I'm going to pay cash. Or they can increase the amount of cash funds in order to satisfy all of the lender's requirements for funding the loan. So let's just say an example would be, it didn't appraise didn't appraise for the amount that they purchased it for, usually the buyer would have to come up with more money. So at least they have that option in order to close. Uh, so one of the things you may want to do, if you think as a buyer the property is not going to appraise, you may want to prep your buyer prior to the appraisal and say, hey, you know what? These are comps. I know we have to offer this price to get the property, but this may happen. If you do that, you're prepping your client, and if it does happen, at least they know. Better than telling them, oh, they didn't appraise. We need to come up with more money. Pretty sure you're going to have a not so happy buyer. Okay? So always, 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 always prep your buyers uh, for the worst. Because uh, if it does happen, at least they say, yeah, okay, you told me. Uh, if it doesn't happen, then that's great. You can move forward to closing. H3, any questions? Okay, we're going to move on to H4. Can you see? Okay. Uh, yes, when I pan. Don't pan. Okay, H4, we are back to Karen. Buyer's obligation. Buyer should act in good faith to obtain the mortgage loan as described in paragraph B2. Buyer is obligated to submit a completed and signed application for the mortgage loan with required fee by A, two days from acceptance and to deliver to the seller to a pre-qualification letter based upon a review of buyer's credit report and items in the loan application by B, two days from acceptance. The pre-qualification letter should state that buyer is credit worthy and qualified for the mortgage loan subject to lender's requirements. However, buyer may substitute a pre-approval letter based upon automatic underwriting or underwriter findings. Buyer is obligated to deliver to seller by seven days prior to close. A condition loan commitment letter based upon underwriter approval and review of property appraisal which shall state that the loan has been approved and lender will make the loan under specific conditions. Buyer should deliver to seller written evidence that buyer has satisfied all conditions 
specified by lender except conditions which cannot be satisfied by buyer until closing, such as pay off a buyer's debt and, or receive by buyers of proceed from the sale of buyer's property no later than five days after insurance of such commitment letter. Buyer authorized seller and seller's broker firm to contact buyer's lender and escrow regarding to regarding the status of buyer's mortgage loan, including commitment letter and satisfaction of conditions. Oh. <laughs> I didn't get that. Could you try that again? I know, yeah, okay. <laughs> All right, I'm cheating. I'm cheating. So buyer's obligation. Uh, anytime you're representing a buyer, uh, these are actually key time frames because one, you want to make sure that you can follow these time frames as a buyer's agent because if you don't, uh, the seller can actually cancel. And two, this is how you make your offer stronger. Okay, so we're just going to go over it one by one so that you guys can understand what this means. So A, blank, and to deliver seller a pre-qualification letter based upon a review of the buyer's credit report and items in the loan application. Okay, so what they're basically saying is you're going to provide seller with a pre-qualification letter. Anybody know the difference between a pre-qualification letter and a pre-approval letter? What was that? Oh, one is stronger. One stronger than the other, correct. Which one's stronger? Pre-approval. 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 Pre-approval.
once the conditional approval is given, you have X amount of days, which is D, uh, to satisfy all of those uh, conditions. Okay, so very important, H4, uh, A, B, C, and D is what you should know what it is and how to explain it, because if you can't, uh, it's tough for your buyers to trust you, and that's what you want to trust. Any questions on H4? Did you say business days instead of just things in the day? Usually work days, not business days. We usually work regular days, not business days. So what if the uh, thing was then Friday, you know, bank closed Saturday to Sunday, you know, you're going to miss that when it's two days? You get it on Friday. Right. Or you get what if well, you accept it like Saturday. Friday? Like bank work Saturday, so I've gotten conditional on Saturday. Oh, okay, so yeah. you just want to say two days, right? You don't want to say two business days. Yeah. Okay. But just make sure you talk to the lender uh, so that they can do it. If they can't do it, there's no reason in putting it down because you're going to get right? So if you say you're going to provide them with uh, proof of application in two days, but you know you can't do it, why even put it down? Uh, that's why it's also key to work with a lender that you know because that lender will pretty much tell you, yes, I can do it within that time frame, no, I can't. Uh, and that's what you want to do, right? Because ideally, we're trying to make this offer as strong as possible. And to do that, you need to communicate. Okay? Because if lender told me, you know what, we cannot close within 30 days, the fastest I can do it is 45, I'm not going to put 30 days, because if that 30 days comes and goes, and we can't get it, and our extension passes, the seller can pretty much cancel it if you choose to it. And we don't want that, because that puts a lot of stress on everybody. Okay? Good. Questions on H4? H5. We have one more, one more page. Two more pages. So H5, 